So, um, so I am, uh, I'm going to share with you how disappointed I am in myself. Um, it did not occur to me until on the plane coming up here that I was going to be giving a talk the Monday after the launch of the Avengers movie, and I was going to be talking about high performance, and there's not one Avengers reference in this whole thing. I'm a geek, and I had a golden opportunity to, um, to spend my talk time focusing on, on comic book characters, and I did not do it. Um, so I am a, uh, a technologist and a strategist focused on innovation and transformation in healthcare. And I'm going to spend my time uh, this morning talking to you about um, how I think um, the industry can evolve in some of the directions that we've been talking about today. Um, and in doing that, I'm going to um, be a little bit contrarian uh, at points. Um, and, and I hope you'll indulge me as I, I do that. Um, I'd like to start by going on a brief uh, mental journey uh, uh, with you, if you don't mind. I'd like for you to imagine for a second that you are a professional race car driver, and you show up to um, the biggest race of the year, and your team has been working on this new car, and uh, so you go over to, uh, to your pit crew and your team to check out this new vehicle and start getting mentally prepared for this race. And you sit down in the car and you notice that on the dashboard of this vehicle there are 87 different gauges. And so you look at your pit crew chief and you say, um, I notice there's a lot of new gauges here. Can you point me to where the speedometer is? And the pit crew chief says, well, we didn't have room to put the speedometer in because the racetrack requires us to install these 87 gauges in here. <laughs> so you say, okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, maybe I can kind of scrape by with that. Can you at least explain what these 87 gauges are doing so, so I can... Uh, I can manage this uh, from a performance perspective. And the pit crew chief says, oh yeah, that's really easy. These gauges give you a continuous feed of exactly what is going on with your vehicle on a 45 minute delay. <laughs> <laughs> and so you go, okay, well, that's interesting. <laughs> can, can, I, uh, can I just ask one more question? Uh, what is it exactly that people expect me then to do with these 87 gauges, given that I'm going to be running at 140 miles an hour around this racetrack? And the pit crew chief says, oh, well, don't worry about it because nobody actually expects you to use any of the data from those gauges until after the race is over. Now, that sounds like an absurd example when you put it in the context of racing. But we're doing that today in healthcare every single day. And it's, it needs to be disrupted. So I'm going to be talking to you about a few concepts today that hopefully will come across as constructively disruptive. <laughs> um, but, but you be the judge of that. And I'm framing it in the context of talking about high performance. Now, if you go out and you start doing some research on what constitutes high performance, there's a lot of research that's been conducted around the high performance of teams and things like that. But the research base is really, really broad. So I'm going to use a layman's definition of high performance today. I'm not going to base it on any official uh, uh, research. And I'm going to argue that high performance can typically be characterized as having five basic attributes to it. High performance is performance that exceeds expectations. So it's usually performance that is beyond what someone would typically think as being reasonable um, in terms of a performance level. Performance that exceeds expectations is also happening reliably, meaning that it's not, a, um, it, it's not something that is happening on kind of a one-off basis. It's happening fairly consistently. It's an attribute. And as a result of that, it's a, it can be demonstrated on demand. So we're actually talking about a capability that can be exercised. Now, you can't have high performance with an unlimited budget, so there has to be some economical dimension to it. It's, uh, so some level of associated costs, whether they be resource costs or financial costs. And the last one is that it's performance that, um, that happens despite uncontrollable variability meaning that 
even when things happen that are not necessarily good um, or that are unplanned, you still can see that level of performance happening. So let's, let's look at that in three specific examples. Um, so uh, the examples that I picked, and you could probably pick others, these were just the ones that I picked. Um, so we'll stick with the racing theme in, in column one. Um, the second one would be battlefield operations for like elite military forces. Um, and the third would be weather prediction. So uh, let's look at, um, at racing, for example. So does racing exceed expectations? Well, uh, my um, accurate MDX does not reliably perform at 140 miles an hour for any sustained, extended period of time. Um, racing cars, obviously, they do. They do it all season long. They do it for every single event that they show up with, whether or not it's raining or sunshiny, doesn't matter. Um, whether or not the track is 105 degrees or 135 degrees or 85 degrees, um, it, does it. it does it at an acceptable level of cost. So there's an economic model that makes racing a very profitable industry. Um, and it does it despite who's in the race, what other cars are in the race. You still continue to see that level of high performance. And you can see that in these other examples as well, um, the military being able to win asymmetrical conflicts. I mean, that's a really interesting concept. It's kind of the definition of, of performing beyond expectations. And certainly uh, meteorology, the whole idea that this is one of the few areas where you can actually tell the future <laughs> and it works most of the time reasonably well. So each of these are examples of what I would characterize as high performance. Now, Let's look at that in the context of healthcare today. I just picked three areas, and I, I picked these to be honest with you because they're the ones I get asked to talk about most often. And the question is, um, if you're talking about quality metrics or clinically integrated networks or risk delegated contracting, how do those trends line up against uh, our conceptualization here today of, uh, of high performance, those five factors? Now, I filled in my answers to these. Hopefully, you have some different answers to these. Um, maybe your organization is doing something a little more compelling um, or a little more interesting. Um, but I don't think these are necessarily uh, far off. I think it's a really hard stretch to say that, for example, um, regularly giving mammography screenings um, or measuring physicians washing their hands exceeds a patient's expectation of care. I just don't think that's true. I don't think it's realistic to say that a clinically integrated network is something that responds well to variability. I don't think that's true. I think it could used to be controlled variability, <laughs> but it does not necessarily account for the natural variability that's already there. So my premise today is that healthcare, as it is today, is not an industry that's operating with any level of high performance um, that would be necessarily noteworthy. Now, I recognize that that is somewhat of a contentious uh, statement, and some of you may want to debate it, and um, I'm around for the next two days, and I'm happy to debate it with you. But for the purposes of this talk, um, I would argue that healthcare as an industry is not operating at um, a high level of performance. So let's, let's deep dive a little bit further into that. Um, so let's stick with the quality metrics column, uh, for example. So I wrote a book a couple of years ago on health analytics. That's what I spend most of my time focusing on is data and analytics and, and healthcare technology. And for the book, I actually had to go out and compile a list of 9,000 quality metrics <laughs> that are currently out there today from which an organization uh, like a provider system might be held accountable. Now, I don't actually know empirically how many metrics it would take to break a provider organization. <laughs> But we gotta be getting close, right? <laughs> we have to be. <laughs> now the questions you gotta ask yourself is, pick any industry, any organization. Is it reasonable to expect any organization to perform at a high level against, I don't know, do a third of that, 3,000 measures? Is that reasonable? And then the next question you have to ask yourself is, if it's not reasonable, how do you know which measures you should be held accountable for? What's the process by which you're deciding what's actually important? You guys with me? Am I being too disruptive? <laughs> I can let my hair out. 
Make up for the Thor effect, right? There is growing evidence that our current conceptualization of quality doesn't actually measure quality or performance. And for anyone who's involved in the process or is, is intimately familiar with the process, as I'm sure my prior speakers are, it should be no surprise to anyone that there is not a strong relationship between what we conceptualize as quality today and what we typically see as performance. Because those quality measures, what we call quality measures, are really representations of good clinical practices. And they're really good things. It is really important that we make sure people wash their hands and they have the right screenings and all that stuff. I'm not arguing against those particular measures. I'm just arguing that good things and important things are two different things. That we should not conceptualize them the same. That we should not get confused that quality, as we're framing it, is some kind of analytic, analytically driven, evidence-based way of driving higher performance. Because it's not. They're not designed that way. Now, I think you had the Atul Gawande uh, quote up earlier about uh, talking about the difference in um, what an individual practitioner can uh, incorporate in their thinking and their decision making versus kind of where we are today. Um, I've been framing that same concept over the past couple of years with this phrase that complexity exceeds cognition. We are at a place in healthcare today where I just don't think it's reasonable to expect performance to be driven solely from the perspective of the individual practitioner. I think there are too many factors and too many variables and too much specialization and too much research that has to be incorporated into decision making to expect any single practitioner, no matter how brilliant they are, to do that unarmed. I'll give you an example. This picture up here is um, something called a fractal flame. Has anybody seen one of these before? A few, raise your hands. Yeah. I had not seen one of these until recently. I was familiar with fractals, but I wasn't familiar with, with um, fractal flames. So, um, so a fractal is, a, um, is basically a uh, pattern that repeats um, sometimes naturally in nature and sometimes it's man-made. And it basically repeats infinitely. And so a, a fractal flame is a particular uh, instantiation of a fractal. And you can see, if you look at this picture, you can see the recursive uh, iterative repetition of the pattern. Um, this is actually um, a, it, uh, th there's a mathematical formula um, that creates this uh, computer generated image. Now, even though you can sense that subtle repeating pattern, it, it literally repeats infinitely. If I asked each of you to sit down and draw that picture, even if I left it up here for you to draw it, <laughs> even if you had it right here in front of you and I said, go ahead and draw this picture, there's no way you would be able to accurately reflect the resolution and the fidelity of what this actually represents, let alone be able to characterize the mathematical model behind it. Prior to the advent of computers, we would not have been able to demonstrate something like this. We could talk about it in the abstract, um, and we could talk about it through the math, but we couldn't actually talk about it visually. So my view of healthcare as a healthcare strategist and someone focused on data analytics is that the, our problem space increasingly looks like this. And the question is, what are we doing to try and institute processes and practices that allow us to capitalize on performance opportunities given that level of sophistication in the ecosystem? So let me give you an example. Um, so our innovation center, um, I, I work at UNC in an innovation center is one of my hats. And, um, and so we recently did a project with um, a company called Forecast Health, which is a health analytics company, to look at um, hospital readmissions and what opportunities might exist to increase our ability to predict hospital readmissions if we were doing a couple of things differently. So one of the things that we were doing differently was um, can you bring in more sophisticated forms of analytical methods to predict hospital readmissions? 
So as opposed to using kind of the traditional approaches or the traditional models out there, which are really based on descriptive statistics, we brought in over 30 different statistical models, things like predictive modeling and neural nets and machine learning and things like that to, um, to look at, is it, can you get better fidelity, can you get better characterization of readmission risk if you use those more sophisticated forms of analytical methods? So that's one thing, one question we looked at. The second question we looked at is, if you added consumer data to that model, so if you went out to one of the standard agencies that compiles um, and licenses vast quantities of consumer data to retailers and telecom companies and financial services organizations, if you brought that into the predictive model, would that make a difference? Would that help the model? Would that help you be able to do something with that model? So what we learned is that um, using predictive analytics absolutely outperforms our accepted kind of traditional view of doing readmission prediction. Um, and in our particular market, um, the financial impact of doing that was more than $10 million a year. And that does not count things like penalty avoidance and stuff like that. That's just straight cost. So makes a lot of sense to start looking at computers as being more sophisticated helpers to that. The second question around consumer data, though, really brings that complexity exceeds cognition more fully into bear. So the question of whether or not consumer data can be used to help this, the answer is basically sometimes. And sometimes it's a really hard thing to operationalize in a clinical rule in an EMR system somewhere. <laughs> Anybody that's had experience trying to institutionalize sometimes, that's really tricky. So it's sometimes because there, it, once you take EMR data and you bring consumer data alongside it, the consumer data is bringing 1,500 different variables about every patient that's in there. You're looking at thousands, potentially millions of permutations of those different variables looking for patterns that may be actionable. So there's no way that anyone would actually be able to pull that off unless you had uh, the, the computer giving that guidance. You can't instruct someone easily on what to do with that information. You really need the computer to help with the decision making process. Does that make sense? Okay. So I would argue that there are 10 attributes of high performance that we should be looking at going forward. When we're making investments in new initiatives, new projects, and I'm gonna show you an a couple of examples of this, I would argue that there are 10 basic attributes that those projects need to have uh, as a part of their scope. Now, I don't have time this morning to go through all 10 of these one by one, so I'm going to take groups of them and kind of walk you through a couple of examples just to illustrate the points that I'm, I'm talking about. And I'm gonna use population health as an example of that just because it's probably top of mind for a lot of you in the room. It's certainly top of mind. It's one of the things I get asked to do a whole lot um, is, is look at population health scenarios. So this is a framework for population health that we developed uh, in the Innovation Center. Um, let me just walk you through what this is basically demonstrating. Um, this is a framework for using analytics to help manage population health. So the way to read it is starting on the right-hand side, there's a series of questions and perspectives that you would want to always ask um, when you're considering taking on um, a population health program. And it doesn't really matter what the population health program is focused on, whether it's diabetes or renal care or what have you. Um, you're going to want to do some risk stratification um, and segmentation of the patient population that's gonna be impacted around this, around this particular program. Uh, so that's at around one o'clock. You're then going to want to know how that population is manifesting in different care settings, which is around two o'clock. So you can kind of work your way around this, this clock diagram with those different perspectives. So that's during the assessment phase when you're planning and designing the program. The right hand side of this is during the monitoring phase. So once you get the program designed and up and running, there's a series of perspectives that you're going to want to be running on a regular basis to know how the program is actually performing. And these two sides of this framework are connected. So the things that we thought might happen to those patients, so what bad things do we expect to happen, how bad are they, how do we expect to manage risk, are things that we actually then want to see what actually happened in the real world. 
And we want to be able to iteratively tune these analytical models over time. So three of those, those attributes I mentioned, design focus, meaning we have a comprehensive framework of connected perspectives here between what we think might be happening and what is actually happening. Process driven, meaning that we know exactly how to move through these different phases and at what points we're going to be making decisions. And closed loop, meaning that when things happen over here in the real world, it gives us the ability to refine our hypotheses on the, uh, on the assessment side um, and improve over time. Um, that's a more effective way of taking on these kinds of programs. Now, hopefully you're looking at some of this and going, well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and then the question is, well, are you doing that then? Because I can tell you, there's a lot of organizations that I talk to, I consult with a lot of different folks, they're not typically doing this. They're putting poker chips down on where they think they may see wins in clinical outcomes or costs. But they don't have this closed loop environment in place. So let's talk about what it would take to close some of those gaps. So um, I've put a few examples up here from other market segments that I think are really interesting to think about in healthcare. Um, the idea of sensor networks, of course, uh, being very predominant. I know there's um, a talk later this morning around um, sensors in healthcare. We certainly see those in things, everything from meteorology to shipping, as a ways, uh, ways of driving closer to um, uh, to closer, better access to what's actually happening in the real world. Situational awareness that we typically see in the military now where deployed troops on the ground are not disconnected from a communication perspective from their command structure and they're able to get much better intelligence and make much better decisions. And most of you have probably at, at some point or another seen NASA's control rooms where they bring together telemetry data and other sources of data to drive all kinds of models around temperature and velocity and trajectory, all kinds of decision support capabilities. We need to be thinking about the same things in healthcare today. So I'll leave you with uh, two quick comments. I'll return to my readmissions uh, example one more time and ask you to think about given these two patients which one do you think is at higher risk of readmission? You have to be able to describe why you think it's at higher risk. <laughs> this has to be a data-driven exercise. So the answer is patient one is at higher risk. Now the question is why? Anybody want to take a stab at why? I'll give you a hint. It has nothing to do with their hospital admissions, their chronic medical conditions, or their number of comorbidities. Sorry? Uh, that is uh, potentially true, um, but that's not the reason why in this particular case. The reason patient one is at higher risk is because they have a normal albumin. Why would normal albumin be an issue? Because this is a bronchitis patient. Why would you run an albumin panel for a bronchitis patient? because there's something going on other than bronchitis and a clinician knows it and they ran albumin test to test it. An analytical model is able to pull that out because it's not just looking at the black and white issues of whether or not a test is normal or abnormal. It's not a simple clinical condition. It's a question of the patient's trajectory. It's a question of this patient looks more like some other patients. So I'll leave you with just thinking about given those attributes are you on a path today for creating a learning health system? I can't tell you, I don't think we as an industry can say with any level of consensus today what a learning health system is, but I can tell you a learning health system has got to be on the path that we've just been talking about, about high performance. Thank you. Thank you.